I am really excited to dive into our next conversation, practicing conviction, partnership, and passion in investing. Um, and so we've got two really incredible speakers. And before I go ahead and introduce them, I did want to go ahead and cover some quick housekeeping. So thank you so much for attending and participating in today, um, Diversity Reboot 2021, Financial Inclusion. I hope that you are as excited as we are, and I really hope that you've been enjoying so far. Um, and if you're just joining us, I want to go over some quick housekeeping. Uh, you know, your camera and audio will remain on for the duration of the talk, but we would love to hear from you. So feel free to add a question or a comment in the chat, and we're going to do our best to get to those. Uh, we'll send those along to the moderator. If you have any technical difficulties, you can feel free to tag myself, Nicole, or Paloma, my colleague, so that we can help you uh, troubleshoot. If you're looking to earn SHRM credits from today's talk, you can just use the code that's on the top left of the screen to grab those. And then we briefly want to refer you to the code of conduct, which we're going to drop in the chat just to make sure that this is a fantastic experience for everyone. Um, and so with that, I'm really excited to introduce our speaker and our moderator for today. So our speaker for today is Kathy Go. Um, as a daughter of a software engineer and small business owner, Kathy has been immersed in technology and entrepreneurship from an early age. She's experienced investing at multiple stages from traditional buyout to venture capital and has also sat on the other side of the table as a business operator. Her breadth of experience has shaped her passion for deeply understanding business models and working hand in hand with entrepreneurs to help scale high growth companies. Through investing, Kathy strives every day to express her core values of conviction, partnership, and passion. And moderating today's conversation, we have Deanna stinson reese Diana is a corporate equity strategist and career coach for minorities. She has 10 plus years of experience in equitable hiring, retention, DEI education, and career development. As a corporate equity educator and strategist, Diana helps companies to understand the power of biases, privilege, race, and social injustices to strategize ways to cultivate truly diverse and inclusive workplaces that retain top diverse talent. Diana serves as a member for the Forbes Coaches Council, a current member of Forbes, The Culture, a partner with Fortune 250 companies, and has been featured in a variety of media outlets. She's also an undiscovered tennis pro, novice guitarist, and travel enthusiast. Her superpower is activating the potential in others. And I've seen that at work, so I can attest to that. And so with that, I am going to hand the mic right over to the both of you, welcome you, and say thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Nicole. Nicole, thank you. You are so amazing. Kathy, she does such a phenomenal job in bringing home with those introduct bringing it home with those introductions. So appreciate her and so appreciate appreciate you for being here with us today. So I'm so so excited to talk more about your career journey um, and really how investors, you know, overall can better support just women um, of color in general in this space, in the financial services space. So uh, let's jump right in because the 30 minutes, I'm going to tell you right now, it goes by fast. So <laughs> I will make sure that there is room for Q&A. Um, so as you have questions for Kathy, please drop them in the comments so that I can ask her as they come up so that you all can really glean uh, the insights that you are desiring from her as we go through this conversation. Let's so, do it. Let's Let's do it. Let's do it. So let's start with your career journey. So can you tell us a little bit more about your journey um, and how you became involved in the finance and tech space? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I grew up in a household that was full of technology. I mean, this is back when, um, you know, people had computers and we were all on AOL chat and we had the dial up modem. My parents are both software engineers and my dad was also a, a small business owner and entrepreneur. So I was definitely immersed in technology from a very, very young age. I remember in our home, we had books full of Python and Java and C++. And I guess my way of rebelling was to not go into technology right away, right? So I went down a different path. I went down the business path. So in college, I studied finance and business, and I really wanted to understand the systems that governed our world, the financial and economic system, which was a world that I didn't know much about. Um, and from there, I did, you know, quote unquote, traditional finance 
for about five years on the East Coast investment banking. And then I later went to a growth equity firm. And at some point, I, I felt the need to explore technology again, right? At that point in time, everyone was talking about SaaS, software as a service. And I was thinking, what is that? What is that? I, I really want to know more. And at the same time, I wanted to scratch my kind of startup or entrepreneurial bug. So I ended up saying, okay, what's the best way to hit two birds with one stone? Let me go ahead and move to the hub of technology, which is the Bay Area, and let me go work for a startup. So I was lucky enough to join a company called Gusto. Uh, before, back then it was called Zen Payroll. They, they provide payroll benefits and HR for SMBs in the United States. And um, that was such an incredible experience. My first time working at a company, you know, Gusto is in a space that many people would consider not super sexy, right? It's payroll. It's kind of the, <laughs> the picks and shovels, but it's very, very important. Um, and I remember going to work my first week and kind of looking around the office. And at that time, I think the average age of employee at Gusto was 27. I was 27 years old myself. And something just clicked in me. There was a spark. I was like, here we are, a group of roughly 200, you know, 27 year olds, and we're building something. We're, we're, we're building a product that's helping small business owners around the country focus on what they do best, serve their customers, and take this, you know, sometimes tedious task off their hands. And the fact that we were, again, a group of 27 year olds that was accomplishing this through software. That was the beauty of technology to me. And I remembered why, you know, my parents love technology. And I was like, okay, I got to go do something with software and something with technology. Um, so I worked at Gusto for just under two years and eventually decided to go back into investing. But this time in venture capital and focused exclusively on software and technology companies. Mm, okay. So you, you mentioned a couple of things here that I want to kind of dive a little bit deeper sure, into sure. um so a gusto i'm very familiar with gusto it's so funny that was the first payroll system i used when i started my business it's so it's so funny to hear you to hear you talk about your experience with gusto like on the on a different side of the um uh, of the i guess uh interactions me on the consumer side you as someone that came in to to work with them but um i'm curious when you think about the fintech space um and how you came in, you saw, of course, early on in your career um, as a young professional, did you notice that there was a lot of representation of women in that space? And if, if not, um, how have you seen that kind of change from the time you started to kind of where you are now? That's a great question, Deanna. I will say that I was so fortunate to be at Gusto, which is one of the companies um, that I know personally care so much about equality, diversity, and inclusion, right? If you think about it, we serve small business owners across the country, and they are different genders, different races, they do different things. It's incredibly diverse. And it was very, very important to the founders of Gusto to create a, a company with employees who reflected that diverse customer base, right? To really gain empathy and understanding of our customer base, we had to at least reflect that diversity. Um, so again, I was super lucky to work in a company that cared deeply about that and not only talk about it, but actually go out and hire a very, very diverse group of people all, across all different um, dimensions. Now, if we zoom out and think about the broader financial services industry, FinTech and Fin Services, I will say that's you know certainly not the norm, right? Gusto was not the norm. Thinking about my career back on the East Coast and what I call traditional finance, I think things have uh, improved. Um, but, you know, it's still not in a place where people are equally represented, uh, represented. And it's something that I think the industry is working to change, albeit slowly. Um, 
when I think about some of the, the barriers, right? I mean, there's barriers at every step of the way, right? Starting from education and folks knowing what opportunities are available to them. And then when it goes to actually, you know, getting people into jobs, um, the financial services industry is very much one of relationships, like many industries, and people tend sometimes to be naturally drawn to others who have similar backgrounds and interests. Um, and so I think one, one really interesting and, you know, hopeful trend that I've been seeing is a lot of these big companies, including my company, Sapphire Ventures, we've invested in diversity and inclusion training to combat those un, um, those biases, subconscious biases up front. So trying to be proactive and get in front of the issue. Good, good. No, that is so important because, you know, as we continue to grow just as a, as a nation overall, when you think about the, the labor market and the corporate landscape of things, it does take proactive thinking and, and proactive action in order to really see things manifest. Everything can't be reactive. And so I think that's awesome that you all are being very proactive in that regard. Now, I wanna kind of pivot into the investment side of, of your journey, right? Uh, so thinking about um, investors and how a lot of times it's challenging for diverse small businesses to access funding and investments and things like that, um, what would you say, or how can you, how can investors better support startups that are launched by people of color and women in general? Let's start there. Yeah, absolutely. I think step one is looking within the organization itself. So in this situation, be a venture capital firm or any other provider of capital and making sure that your employee base, your team is diverse and representative, right? So making sure that there's people of color and women on your own teams. And this is important uh, because I'm gonna go back to something I said earlier. Um, venture capital and uh, investing you know, as an asset class is very heavily human capital or relationship driven. Mm. People are investing in companies um, through networks that are pre-existing networks. And if you're an outsider, if you don't have access to tap into those networks, uh, it's hard to get in, A. And B, if you do get in, sometimes there are um, gaps in understanding when you know, you're pitching a um, female health product to a bunch of you know, older white men, right? <laughs> oftentimes happen. So I think it's really important for firms themselves to make sure that they have uh, uh, investment staff and team that is representative and diverse. Uh, the second thing I would say is um, you got to do your homework in two ways, right? When you're approaching investor, look at his or her investing track record and know what types of companies that individual typically invests in. It's really, really hard to get in front of investors sometimes. So you wanna know that the people you're trying to get in front of are the ones who would actually feasibly invest in your company and understand your space. The second part of the work and research is once you've identified a couple of people that you think more than a couple, uh, you know, people that you think, you know, because it is a numbers game, right? You identify people, investors that you think could potentially invest in your company and understand your space. You got to find a way into their network. Um, I'm not saying that a cold email doesn't work. Sometimes it does. But I'm also saying that as investors, especially earlier stage investors, there's just a flood of inquiries and emails and oftentimes it's really hard to get to them all so if you have a first second even third degree connection that you can lean on it's very very helpful um, and if you haven't done your homework in step one maybe you're trying to you're spending all this time trying to get in front of the wrong person you know what I mean mm -hmm. yeah not putting the cart before the horse it sounds like right like gotcha okay that's really good now, as you grew in your career, I'm sorry, I just another question popped in my head as you were talking, right? Like working through some of the challenges that um, small business owners or diverse business owners, you know, 
have to face to kind of get in front of the investors. I'm curious for you throughout your career outside of Gusto, right? We know Gusto was like that anomaly when you think about just the fintech space. Um, what were some challenges you had to overcome as you kind of began to progress in your career and pivot, you know, into the investment side? And how did you work through those challenges? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, gosh, there were there are so many, um, and some yeah. of them might be attributed to just age, right? Um, you know, part of it is people always say, you know, I'm the person with the white hair in the room as a way to say I'm the, you know, experienced person with, with a track record. So sometimes it is hard getting your voice heard and being influential as a young person. So age is one factor, age and experience, but other factors include um, potentially gender and potentially um, having people, working with people, pitching to people who may not look like you or um, have your same background. So it's hard for me to attribute um, some of the challenges I faced personally in my professional career to any of those factors. But I will say um, the number one thing is how do you get your voice heard and how do you have influence uh, even kind of at a, a younger age? And there's so many ways to think about that, unbundle that, cut that into different dimensions. But I think, especially for women, a lot of us default to, okay, well, I just got to work 10 times harder than any other guy in the room. Um, a lot of my, you know, female colleagues and friends all think that, and that's good. And we, I think we, we all should think, you know, strive to work hard and succeed, but there's other things that we should also focus on, right? Those interpersonal relationships. As I mentioned, this industry is all about relationships. So how do you find mentors, but even more advocates within your own organization and external mentors as well to kind of lift you up? Uh, if you focus and over-index on just, I'm going to work harder than anyone else, uh, it might work, but it may not work. Yeah, a lot of times that let me, um, you know, I don't want to say go above and beyond, but as a um, career professional, it is important to be very strategic in how you're doing that because a lot of times they see that you did the work or maybe they don't see that you did the work and you still don't, you still don't get any further, um, especially, you know, as women, we, we face that a lot. So I think that that's really sound advice. Um, now that you are in the investing space, how do you use investing really to um, express your own core values, um, your partnership, your passion? How do you use the space that you're in now to amplify or express those things? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, my, the core values that uh, Nicole mentioned in the beginning, conviction, partnership, and passion. These are my core values in life in general. And I'm so lucky to have found a profession and career as an investor that lets me live those core values in my job every, every single day, right? So mm -hmm. take conviction, for example. Um, I feel so lucky because I feel like I have the best job in the world. I'm essentially paid to learn about different yep. industries and develop relationships with amazing people. And part of the the hardest part of my job, because I talk to so many amazing entrepreneurs with amazing companies, is which one do you pick to give an investment to? It's really, really difficult. So my approach has always been do the work on the industry, on the business model, spend time with the team to gain deep conviction in, in an opportunity. And I'll say it's not easy, right? Again, especially with earlier stage companies, there's a lot of question marks. And oftentimes it does take a leap of faith to see where the company could go. But building that sound conviction is really, really important. And, and partnership, I mean, that sounds self-explanatory, but as venture capital investors, we are not just providers of capital. We strive to partner with and build companies the consequence. We wanna be in that partner seat. We wanna be able to be the shoulder to lean on. We wanna be able to help our CEOs with anything he or she potentially needs. And, and lastly, um, passion, right? You, 
in my opinion, you can't really be truly good at something if you don't have passion for it. And in our job, and especially in the role of an entrepreneur, I know just how hard it is. It's a battle every single day, maybe every single hour. If you don't have that passion to keep you going, um, you're going to fail. So um, I'm super excited to be able to have a job that lets me live out all of those um, core values. That is what it is about. I love that. And I can only imagine, right? You probably see so many companies. You're like, ah, oh, I would love to be like, you know, be able to give you this money, but maybe they're just not quite there yet and things of that sort. And so um, as I, as we start to slowly wrap up, I do want to make sure I give a moment uh, for you to share with those in the audience that may be, um, entrepreneurs uh, that are early entrepreneurs, maybe, you know, midway through their scaling phase for their business, or maybe they've already scaled, what would be probably your top three um, pieces of advice for these individuals that are like glued to the screen right now, listening and trying to figure out like, okay, how do I make sure I'm not that person that's showing up to any investor? Like, ill prepared on the side of like where my business is versus, you know, doing the research, of course, but thinking about where my business is and how do I show up as my best self or bring my business to the forefront as its best self? Yeah. Um, A couple of thoughts here. Um, Number one, it's very tempting to raise, uh, to raise money in today's environment. It's a very, I'll say pro founder environment. There's a lot of capital floating out, out there. Right. Um, but be thoughtful, be thoughtful and say, you know, uh, why, why am I trying to raise money? Um, you know, there's going to be a dilution element. You're giving up control a, a portion of ownership in your company in exchange for that money. Think about, why am I trying to raise that money? What am I going to use that money for? Um, in a way, run a kind of an ROI, return on investment analysis for this exchange of equity. What am I going to do with that capital infusion that I'm going to get? So that's one. Don't get caught up in the hype and the cycle. Everyone's raising money. I should raise money. Really take a hard think about why you want to raise uh, external capital. Um, you know, there's plenty of great businesses out there who have been bootstrapped. Um, highly, highly quality and growing companies have been bootstrapped. I'm not saying that's the best, best route for everyone, but it is a route that I think should be considered. Um, number two, taking money from a venture capitalist is like getting into a marriage, a long-term relationship at least with them. That person, especially if he or she joins your board, is going to be with you for a very long time, whether you like that individual or not. So treat it like you're, you know, evaluating um, going into a long-term relationship with this person. Um, You know, when they're trying to sell you on uh, the deal, everything is going to be rosy and happy, right? It's really easy to get along when things are going well, but you have to remember that, especially for a startup, Things are up and down all the time. You can't help it. And you want to make sure that that person is the person that you want in your corner when things are not going well. And uh, they'll be there to support you and um, pull you through it, right? Yeah. And I would say the last thing is, um, I mean, this is, a, this is a cheesy one, but but don't give up. I mean, I've looked at, hundreds, maybe thousands of companies at this point in time. And things are never easy. I mean, I think the the role of a startup founder and entrepreneur, it's as close to being on a roller coaster as any other job. You have really, really high highs one day and very, very low lows, maybe in the next hour, not even the next day. And it takes that certain type of perseverance. And again, that passion to keep Mm -hmm. going. But as someone who's seen that story play out many times, keep at it, be present, you know, have faith in yourself, trust yourself, make sure you have the right people around you and keep going. Absolutely. I, oof, I love it all, especially that last one. It seems so simple, but yet it's so vital because you're going to hear no's, right? So you have to be persistent 
and, and keep pushing through with that. This is, that's awesome. Um, so now let's, let's pivot a little bit. Um, cause I do want you to have time to, um, answer any questions that any additional questions, uh, that come through as well as I want to give time for folks to know where to follow you to stay up to date, um, with things you have going on and just any content that you put out on any platforms that will help them to stay informed. Um, one last question, um, before I, oh no, actually, okay. Let me do the question that's actually in the chat because I'm bouncing back and forth. So I want to just make it about me and my questions that I have for you. <laughs> when you think about those um, professionals that do hear no, right? Those business owners, how, so either one of two things, how have you been able to persevere through the no's when you've heard them or any advice for kind of how to, na how to navigate that for, um, individuals that are um, trying to get money from investors or, you know, develop that partnership that you just explained. I love telling this story. Um, I had the great privilege of meeting Eric Yuan, who is the CEO and founder of Zoom. Everyone knows Zoom. We're using Zoom right now. We are. He has a great story. I mean, he was rejected by almost every single investor in Silicon Valley, because at the time people were like, oh, you know, this is way before, you know, the pandemic and everyone was working from home. But it's like, there's no moat here. There's no differentiation. You just have, um, you know, a video conferencing platform. No, 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 no. Um, and look at where Zoom is now, right? Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> crazy but at the time when you hear the no it's going to sting if you're an entrepreneur the company is your baby and it's so heartbreaking to me as an investor to tell a founder no because you just know what they're feeling inside and it's, it's just terrible but here's what i would say that you can do to turn that um into a silver lining if you will right um number one if there's anything any lessons that can be learned from that no Think about it, take that nugget, file it away and iterate on it. So an example of that would be, hey, um, this company, you know, you guys are focused on B2C, go to market motion, um, and we're mostly focused on B2B companies, right? So it wasn't a right fit to begin with. File that away and start to refine your, your um, investor focus a little bit more. Sometimes there's not going to be a reason. Sometimes, you know, the investor will not be super candid or honest with feedback and that's okay. Um, you, you take that and kind of move on. But if there's any lessons to be learned from that no, take it. You can also ask the investor, right? So I always um, offer to have a follow-up call to share my diligence and my process evaluating the company. Uh, sometimes I share, you know, a redacted customer call notes. Sometimes I share kind of our market analysis take whatever you can from that no and turn it into something useful for yourself. But again, sometimes you're not going to learn anything. It's going to suck. Um, but in that case, just say, okay, I'm, my skin is more tough than it was before. And I'm going to move on. There you go. I love it. That was, that's spot on. And that's not just with uh, approaching investment. Those of you out there, that is just in life period when we hear no's, right? That's the mindset that we need. So that is really great, Kathy. Um, why don't you go ahead and as we wrap up, because I know we're pretty much at time. I told you it flies by. Uh, tell, tell everyone how they can follow you, where to find you, all, all the good deets on how we can stay in contact with you. Yeah, absolutely. I do have a Twitter account um, at CGAO. I'm not super, super active on Twitter, but I'm trying to be more active. It's a great, um, it's a great resource. I'm more of a Twitter lurker, but it's a great resource to connect with people, get news about technology and about the venture ecosystem. Um, you know, VC Twitter is definitely a thing. You can also mm -hmm. find me on LinkedIn, um, just at Kathy Gao, um, and I usually respond to my LinkedIn messages, but those are the, probably the two primary channels to get in touch with me. Perfect. Thank you so much. So make sure you, all of you go follow her, stay in contact. This was so awesome, Kathy. Thank you again for your time and for your insights. It was oh, so great. Oh, this is so fun. Thank you for having me. 
Yes, Nicole, I'm going to pass it over to you. Fantastic. Well, thank you for such an awesome conversation. And I specifically love that we finished with the part about, you know, how to redirect nose and where to go from there. I think following up and asking for feedback is such an important part of getting a no. So thank you for that and honing in on that. Um, and so thank you both for being here. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We're so excited to have you.